Hello everyone, it's Tuesday, June 27th. I'm David Song, Currency Analyst with Daily FX, here to cover the Conference Board's uh, U.S. Consumer Confidence Survey, uh, where we'll see how that will fare. This is uh, for the month of June. We're looking for a small t uh, downtick here. Uh, could, again, reveal that we are going to see household sentiment narrow for the third consecutive month in June. So we'll see how that will fare. Uh, of course, we're seeing some interest in the euro today as we are seeing this event at the European Central Bank. We got some interesting commentary from ECB President Mr. Mario Drahi. Uh, so we'll dig into some of those things in just a little bit, but we still have some more rhetoric to watch later on this afternoon. So uh, let's start off with the economic docket here. Uh, so again, we are looking for a small downtick in the conference board's consumer confidence survey to 116 from 117.9. So again, we'll see if in fact we see, we'll see how the U.S. data will fare here as uh, we have seen, especially as of late, some weaker than expected data prints coming out of the region. Even if you looked at uh, the S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index from earlier this morning, missing market ex expectations, seeing that slower growth in home prices. So we'll see uh, if consumer sentiment will follow some similar dynamics there. But don't forget, guys, later on this afternoon, we do have some Fed officials to watch, especially some 2017 voting members. So uh, we do have... Uh, Mr. Harker back on the wires. He was speaking earlier this morning, um, but we'll see what he will say. Uh, again, continues to reinforce this idea that we can see three, maybe four rate hikes in 2017. So again, Mr. Patrick Harker of the Philadelphia Fed, he is a 2017 uh, voting member. And then uh, following that, we do have Chair Janet Yellen talking about again, global issues, if you will. We'll see if Chair Yellen will mention anything in terms of the monetary policy outlook. But then, you know, after we get those comments from Yellen, we also have Mr. Neil Kashkari. Right? He is also a voting member this year. He was the lone dissenter, you know, fighting against that rate hike that we got earlier on this month. So I wouldn't be surprised if we do get some more dovish language from Mr. Um, Mr. Kashkari. But, you know, we'll see what sort of tone Chair Yellen will strike uh, especially after the Fed unveiled this more detailed exit strategy in terms of how they plan to unload the balance sheet. Um, but still a lot of unanswered questions. We'll see when they will look to start unloading the balance sheet. And we'll see whether or not the Fed will, in fact, deliver three rate hikes in 2017. But for now, just uh, before we go anywhere, guys, let me just share market expectations. And you know, even though we got that 25 base point rate hike, we got that detailed exit strategy, you know, it looks as though markets are a little bit unconvinced that the Fed will, in fact, three, deliver three rate hikes this year. So, you know, if you look at Fed funds, uh, Fed fund futures, markets are widely expecting the Fed to retain the current policy at the next quarterly meeting in September, right? So, again, we're seeing this 87% probability that the Fed will keep that benchmark in street at the current threshold of 1.0 to 1.25%. And then for December... You know, it looks as the markets are still split here. It's going back and forth between 50-50, but, you know, can't really argue that there's been a material shift in some of these expectations more so. I think market participants are waiting for a little bit more clarity. And, you know, even on our end as, as traders here, I think we need to see what sort of data prints come out of the U.S. economy, uh, especially as we have seen some batch of weaker than expected data prints coming out of the region. So, you know, there are some themes that I have been talking about, especially given that we've got all these updates from the Federal Reserve, all these updates from the European Central Bank early on this month. So, you know, let me just bring up uh, sort of expectations surrounding the Federal Reserve. And, you know, we'll see if the Fed uh, will be at risk. We'll see if they will come under pressure to further revise some of their economic forecasts. So, you know, let me just do sort of a side-by-side -side comparison. I'm sure you guys are watching what's happening with the euro today, taking out those 2017 highs, taking out the highs from last November. But this is, you know, one of the arguments that I was certainly bringing up after we got some of these projections out of the, you know, Federal Reserve. You know, they continue to look for this 2.2% expansion in terms of rate of growth for this year, 2.1% over the course of next year. However, it's really the inflation front you know, that I think we need to keep a very close eye on. And, you know, the one sort of theme that I was talking about here is, is the Fed a little bit more upbeat on inflation than their European counterparts. So, you know, if you look at the inflation forecast, right, little change there from the March projections, just a small downward vision for the 2017 figures. But 
over the policy horizon, over the next two to three years, they're still expecting inflation to hit 2%. However, you know, I think we need to compare this to what the ECB has revealed. And again, these economies are very different, right? Uh, U.S. economy more consumer driven, right? Um, but here's what the ECB has laid out for us, right? They actually raised their growth forecast to an annualized 1.9%. So, you know, I, I think this is starting to bring up the discussion, right? Uh, if the Eurozone is going to be just behind the U.S. economy in terms of growth, right? 1.9% is, again, pretty good rate of growth given what the euro area has faced over the last couple of years. But, you know, given that the ECB has boosted their for growth forecast, does it warrant that they're still conducting those asset purchases? And even beyond that, yes, they curbed the inflation forecast a little bit, right? Over the next couple of years, uh, we, they've, again, trimmed some of those forecasts. But, you know, if we scroll down, and that's, you know, the sort of point I want to make here, who's right, right? The ECB trimmed their inflation forecast all the way through 2019, right? A minor decline, but nevertheless, they still revised the again, inflation forecast over the policy horizon, right? They've trimmed that forecast, unlike the Fed, right? And if you look at the breakdown of the table here, oh, I got to zoom up. But I think the big reason why, and I think we got some clarity on that from Mr. Drahi this morning, where he's saying the weakness in inflation is largely due to temporary factors. And, you know, if you look at their oil forecast, largely reflects what we heard from Drahi today, right? They trimmed, again, their oil price forecast by just about $4 for this year, $4 for next year, and then just about $3, let's say $4 for 2019, right? So this is, again, what Drahi is telling us today. Yes, they're upbeat on the economy after they raise their growth forecast. Maybe we can see stronger economic activity down the road, but for now, Maybe it really is transitory factors, temporary factors that are weighing down on headline inflation. And again, is that why the Federal Reserve sort of kept the core PCE projections, the core personal consumption expenditure, right? Fed's preferred gauge for inflation. Is that why they held it unchanged? But, you know, even if you look at the headline rate for PCE inflation, those were unchanged, right, for 2018, 2019. And this is where I'm seeing a bit of disconnect, right? Who's right? Who's wrong? Um, is the Fed a little bit more upbeat on inflation than the ECB? But for now, I think the bigger surprise is really coming out of the ECB, right? This upbeat tone, the upward vision in some of their growth forecasts. And, you know, will this all eventually lead to a potential taper tantrum in the euro area? And I think that's what, you know, markets are sort of honing in on uh, right now, especially given some of the hawkish language coming out of the ECB this morning. So, We'll take a quick look at price action and, you know, I think there has been a material change in market behavior for the euro after the French elections. I think that was sort of the fundamental catalyst, if you will, uh, that has really driven the change here. But after we've broken out of this downward trend carried over from last year, you know, we're still favorable on the euro dollar. We had a minor correction going on, holding above that 111.20, uh, zoned very nicely, dabbled below that, but again, doing a very good job of closing above that region throughout the month of June. So, you know, are we in for another move higher? For that, I'm watching the RSI, uh, the Relative Strength Index. I think we are on the cusp of seeing a nice bullish signal here, if you will, on the oscillator as it starts to threaten the bearish formation here carried over from last month. So we'll see if this will continue to uh, take shape in terms of the RSI signal. But, you know, as we're taking out those monthly highs, the yearly highs, and as we're taking out those highs from last November, I mean, the U.S. presidential election market reaction, if you will, it looks as though we may continue to see some of these topside hurdles taken out maybe in the second half of the year. So, you know, in terms of the ECB, you know, they still have that deadline, the December deadline for the QE program. So, you know, if we continue to see some of the, uh, some better than expected coming, uh, better than expected data coming out of the euro area, again, may push the governing council to wind down those asset purchases over the coming months. And don't forget, guys, the ECB only has four more meetings, four more meetings left for the remainder of the year. So, you know, if they're going to move, you know, maybe we could get some sort of uh, clarity on that over the coming months. But for now, I think we're getting a lot more surprises, if you will, out of the ECB in terms of how they're changing their tune for monetary policy. And as long as that continues, you know, I think we're going to, we still need to watch some of the top side targets. Euro dollar coming into a big zone here, 113.30 into that 113.50 zone. That's going to be sort of a big hurdle to watch from where we are. Uh, not too far from the highs that we set during last August. So we'll see if some of those levels will come back into play. But for now, 
you know, it looks as though the path of least resistance for the euro remains tilted to the top side. And if we continue to see the ECB largely adopt a more upbeat tone, we may see this continue, uh, especially down the road. So we'll continue to watch some of these themes. And again, guys, as the ECB is holding this event this week, a lot of central bank rhetoric. And again, to bring back that calendar, uh, Mr. Drahi will be speaking again, uh, I believe, tomorrow morning. Um, he'll be uh, participating in some sort of panel, I believe, but we also have BOE officials on the wire. So um, even though the economic document remains fairly light for this week, the last full week of June, a lot of rhetoric to watch, and hopefully we'll get a little bit of a better sense of you know, how markets will operate going into July. But with that out of the way, you know there are some other markets that I'm keeping a very close eye on, and you know keep a close eye on what's happening with oil here, right? Uh, it's funny that we're getting these ECB comments, and you know we're seeing this nice recovery in oil prices. But you know we'll we'll see how the inventory numbers come out tomorrow. But you know I think we are starting to get some technical signals, if you will, uh, that maybe the decline was stretched here. Maybe we could get a, a rebound, a correction. But for now, the bigger picture. Unfortunately, at least on my end, looks a little bit more bearish after we've broken down or failed to preserve this longer term trend that we have carried over from last year. So we'll see whether or not we get a further decline, especially in terms of energy prices down the road. We'll see if that will continue to be a boon in terms of these inflation forecasts coming out of these major central banks. But, you know, a nice recovery going on right now. We'll see a former support zone right around that 4520 zone will offer some fresh resistance going forward. But, you know, it's carving out a nice series of higher highs and higher lows at the moment. I'm just calling this correction as we're coming back off of fresh yearly lows, right? So we'll see if, again, how the inflation picture will continue to pan out. But, you know, there's another dynamic that I think we need to watch here. And let me just bring up Treasury yields. Um, because I think this is certainly telling a sort of meaningful story about, you know, we are seeing some disconnect in some markets. So if you guys have been watching uh, treasury prices and stock prices, U.S. stock prices, they have been moving together, which is, you know, sort of an unheard dynamic or, you know, it gives markets a sense that something is broken, right? So right now, 30-year treasury yields, they're rebounding off of fresh 2017 lows. But as we continue to see this weakness, not only in U.S. yields, but also in interest rate expectations, you know, is the dollar in for a f further decline? And you know what? Let me just bring up the dollar index for you guys where, you know, have we really broken down from that bullish trend that we have carried over from last year? Right? Does it suggest that, again, maybe dollars more vulnerable to the downside, right? So we'll see, you know, how things will, you know, largely pan out over the near term. And Dale here. Glad to see you, my friend, and Dale noting, you know, not really bonds and stocks have been going up together the last eight years. And, you know, Dale, I think that's sort of the argument market participants are taking is that, you know, ever since the Fed especially has conducted quantitative easing, right, maybe some of these market metrics that we're used to seeing have broken, right? And, you know, I think that's what we're waiting on, right? A uh, big theme that markets were, you know, talking about is, you know, and especially let's talk about the equities rally, right? the great rotation, when is it going to happen? And you know, for those of you that are unfamiliar, let me get to it in just a second, guys, because the data is going to come out. So you know what? I'm just bringing up a five-minute chart first real quickly. We'll see if, again, we get this downtick in the consumer confidence survey. We'll see if that will give you a further boost. And I'll just leave dollar yen here on the radar as well. Um, but again, we are looking for a print of 116 for the conference board's consumer confidence survey. And we're just seconds out from that, guys. Um, And Dale, just noting here, good to see you, David. I just gave a presentation to investors yesterday where I basically says stocks and bonds lower together in coming weeks. And you know what, Dale? Could be. And for now, one thing I will look at is really when the Fed will really start to unload their balance sheet, right? They already gave us this sort of preset course of, you know, how they will reduce these asset holdings. Um, but for now, you know, I think that the sort of kicker that we got from Yellen was the fact that she really didn't give us a timing on when we can expect this because remember the game plan was they're going to remove the zero interest rate policy first and then they were going to look at removing some of these non-standard measures. Uh, but here we go with some of the data guys. Uh, the Richmond Fed Manufacturing Index, a little bit better than expected, came in at seven. Uh, we were looking for a print of four and I'm still waiting for the conference board numbers here. Give me a quick second. Let me just check my news wires real quickly. Again, seven 
for Richmond Fed, 118.9 for the U.S. Consumer Confidence Survey. So uh, I guess we're seeing the dollar catching a little bit of a bid here. Dollar yen making fresh session highs. But again, we have Yellen, Chair Janet Yellen on the wires later on this afternoon. So uh, to be perfectly honest, guys, my expectations, I wasn't personally looking for much, especially given the you know sort of uh, sort of excitement that we're getting you know, given the commentary from the ECB. So let's get back to our discussion and, and you know, guys, feel free to chime in as we're, you know, talking about these interesting themes, but um, bring it back to sort of what's happened with U.S. equities, right? As the Fed was purchasing mortgage-backed securities, mortgage treasuries, right, um, certainly fueled risk appetite. Markets were looking as, you know, they called it the Bernanke put, right? When the central bank is buying, why not buy with them? So, What's the other side of the coin, right? Is once the Fed is done, once they're looking to unwind those non-standard measures, will the markets follow and will all these advances that we've seen, right, will they all start to unravel, right? So that's gonna be a big theme to watch. And again, then guys, that's what markets participants are calling the great rotation, right? Is when the Fed really changes their course for monetary policy and again, not normalizing, but again, maybe start to tighten policy, right? So again, I don't think we got any sense that we'll see, you know, an imminent move in terms of the balance sheet, but I am starting to see some speculation. Um, again, I don't want to name specific, but some of the big banks are starting to talk about that. And maybe we can see the Fed implement this QE exit as soon as September. Right? So again, is that a reason why we're seeing interest rate expectations so depressed? Right? Because you know, Fed officials have said you know narrowing the benchmark, uh, narrowing the balance sheet would be the same as raising the benchmark entry. So a lot of things to watch here in terms of Fed's guidance for us going forward but right now you know I have to stick with the trend right that's the only thing I want to say here there's a lot of these longer term sort of themes dynamics that we'll look for but you know only when we get there and again with the with the Fed and this is the biggest kicker that I I think that we got from Chair Janet Yellen um, she was asked a question there in the press conference right um, we're almost halfway to that 3.0 threshold for the Fed funds rate so you know when do you think the normalization cycle for the benchmark interest rate is well underway because that's when the Fed will start unloading. And Chair Yellen largely didn't answer that question. So again, really didn't, didn't get too much conviction that the Fed is in a rush to unload the balance sheet. So for now, you know, I have to stay constructive here. And you know, we are seeing some weakness across the benchmark equity indices. And you know, despite the strength that we're seeing in the year, we are seeing some weakness in European equity. So you know, we'll see if some of those themes. Right. We'll continue to take shape, less dovish ECB, stronger euro. Will that also equate to maybe some weakness in European equity? So a lot of themes that we're watching right now, um, but moving forward, and let me just bring back the dollar index, You know, despite the Fed rate hike, despite the detailed exit strategy, and this is the one thing I think we're all you know, trying to assess here, is the dollar run over? Are we going to see a more bearish course for the dollar here? And which currencies will largely benefit from this, right? So I think the euro is a good counterpart to watch, and you know I think we also need to pay very close attention to some of these uh, emerging market currencies. And 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 this is the one thing I want to talk about, guys. Where is this also reflecting a change in behavior, right? So we talked about the euro breaking out of the downward trend from 2016, dollar index, the DXY, failing to preserve that bull trend from 2016, and you know same story here for the dollar peso, dollar max, has it broken a long term trend? Does this signal signal a change in market behavior for the dollar? And you know, that's why I'm picking you know different pairs, right? A major dollar currency pair and then an emerging market currency pair. But you know, if even if you want to throw like dollar rand in the mix, and this is one of the discussion you know I was having uh, with some of the guys on the table, you know, despite all the you know risks surrounding South Africa, right? They no longer have an investment grade um, credit rating. Uh, we'll see what's going to happen with the independence of the SARB, South Africa Reserve Bank. Meanwhile, the economy is back in a recession, right? But does it make sense that we're seeing the South African rand hold its ground, right, against the U.S. dollar? Does it really make sense here? And I think that's where, again, does this signal a broader shift in market behavior? And, and I'll show you this trend, right? Very clean trend that we had in the dollar rand for multiple years until we finally broke down. So keep some of the theme, you know keep some of these themes in mind, and this is where I want to point out one thing also. Even beyond some of the you know weakness that we're seeing in the dollar, maybe this bearish sentiment really start to um, come about for the greenback. What else can we see benefit off of that? Maybe gold. 
Uh, so, Mr. Butchers and I, we actually just finished up, uh, wrapped up our quarterly forecast for gold prices. And again, we have seen some weakness following the rate hike out of the Federal Reserve. But is this one also showing a change in behavior? And I t I'd taken out some of my former trend line. So, like, you know, we've broken out of this trend line from last year already. Right? And I think the bigger discussion, especially with, you know, a lot of my colleagues here at Daily FX is, are we really trying to break out, out of this long-term bearish trend from all the way back from those record highs in 2011, right? So again, just putting all the pieces together here, right? dollar not looking too good against maybe one of its most popular pairs, right? Like the Euro, uh, not too good against emerging market, uh, emerging market currencies. And not only that, you know, are we seeing this flight away from fiat currencies and maybe we're gonna see you know, security such as gold benefit off of that. And for now, I need a little bit more clarity, but you know, we are seeing this sort of coiling action going on with gold. So I do think we're going to see volatility pick up in the second half of the year. And again, we'll see whether or not the Fed will in fact deliver three rate hikes this year. But a lot of interesting things going on. And you know, one thing I just want to point out here is copper. Quite interesting. And despite the weakness in gold, you know, I like to watch some of these hard commodity prices together. But despite the weakness in oil, which you know I think is driven by a lot of factors right now, but copper doing fairly well, breaking out its downward trending channel, looks as though you know we could be in for a near-term move. And all this is happening while well, I think dollar yen is you know, maybe an interesting dynamic and maybe we can see the dollar strengthen against the yen here. Um, but for now, you know, I'm a little bit cautious on what's happening with the Japanese yen here. Uh, if you look across the board, uh, one of my favorite pairs is like Aussie yen. It looks like we could see some yen weakness across the board. Could be suggestive again that we are seeing risk sentiment hold up. That we might see that continue over the rest of the year. And will we see the yen continue to take a hit on that? So a lot of themes that I'm watching right now, and again, as we wrap up the, the month here, wrap up the quarter, I still think there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unanswered questions that you know markets are waiting on, especially in terms of the monetary policy outlook. But, um, but for now, guys, I would stress, I think we need a bit of caution as we will wrap up the month with a lot of central bank rhetoric, right? To chew on, to digest, right? So we'll see how we'll close out the month, we'll close out the quarter, but I think these are some of the themes that we need to watch where, Yen weakness, will that continue to become the case? As it seems as though the BOJ will only will be the only remaining game in town. Right? ECB taking more of an upbeat tone. They still have the deadline for December in terms of the QE program. So, you know, will we see the ECB take away from this pool of monetary support? And will the BOJ largely be the only game in town? And beyond that, and again, I'll just bring it back to the DXY. I think, you know, oops, very interesting dynamic that's going on. Whoops, keep typing in DYX. Uh, but again, with this break of trendline support, does that mean that we will see some further weakness in the dollar? We will continue to make fresh 2017 lows over the course of the year. And for now, uh, another thing that I will watch going forward is, again, equities market. I know it's very tempting to try to call tops and bottoms, guys. But again, until we see uh, definitively of when the Fed will start to unload their balance sheet, I have to stay supportive because there's still a lot of bullish structures in play, right? This trend line going on and, you know, even if you want to look at like the Nikkei 225, we've made fresh 2017 highs last week. We've broken that, you know, monthly opening range. There's a lot of good dynamics that price continues to reflect. So I don't want to find a lot of these trends right now, um, but we'll see how long that will last, right? And Dale, that's why I'm glad you sort of brought this up that, you know, there could be a big turn. Right? And I do think that, again, maybe the big kicker, the, the catalyst will be the Fed unwinding the balance sheet. But, you know, I think only time will tell. We'll know when we get there. But, you know, that has been a theme markets have been watching for the last few years is when the Fed starts to unload, get rid of these non-standard measures, will the markets go with it? Right? So I hope you enjoy the, uh, you know, the quick overview on the data, guys. And, you know, just some of the themes that I want to bring up here going into uh, the end of the month and the quarter. But, again, a lot of central bank rhetoric on tap over the remainder of the week. We'll see how that will all fare for the near term outlook. But again, looks like the dollar weakness may persist. We'll see if we get a little bit more clarity for gold prices going forward. And you know, for now, I'm a bit surprised that again, some of these hard commodity prices, excluding oil, right, is showing some of this resilience, if you will, you know, even though there's still a lot of concerns about global growth, geopolitical risks, right, especially with these emerging market economies. Um, but copper holding off fairly well could be a nice trend to watch, right? And we'll see if some of these themes will continue to pan out next month but hope you guys enjoyed the overview and uh, just to bring back a five minute chart of the euro dollar I'm watching it on my other end but not much going on here guys i think 
Again, bit of a pullback here as we did get some better than expected data at the 10 o'clock hour. Again, consumer confidence beating market expectations, same story for Richmond Fed. Um, but again, it looks as though we may have to wait for Cherry Ellen, um, as I'm sure markets are very inclined to gauge the timing right, of the next Fed rate hike. But with that, guys, I'll be back tomorrow to do another Q&A, and I'll bring up some more of these topics. Some of the you know, trade setups that I'm really inclined to watch, and the ones that I'm really watching right now, I think we talked about this last week, was you know, it's going to be these euro versus commodity block currencies, right? I think Pete, I don't know if Pete's in here today, uh, not today, but we got this nice pullback across some of these euro crosses, but is it now time to engage again? Um, is it time to instill a more bullish outlook for some of these crosses as, again, we've broken out some long-term structures. So even like the euro pound, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, but are we on our way to make fresh 2017 highs here? Again, I think we've negated this head and shoulders top formation many times. I have a type side bias here. So we'll see what Drahi and, again, maybe the remaining ECB officials will see that what they will reveal as they continue to conduct this event um, over the coming days. But with that, guys, have a great day, and I hope to see you all again tomorrow for the Q&A session.